All right. <clears throat> so why don't we get started here? Uh, so welcome and thank you for attending uh, the, I don't even know how many sessions I've done of this, of the introduction to SIG cluster lifecycle. Um, I am one of the co-chairs of the SIG cluster lifecycle inside of the community. I'm also a member of the steering committee. Um, we've been at this game for a long time. Uh, so if you're new to the community, welcome. Um, it's always good to see new faces and to get new people involved. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to give you an overview of broad strokes of what SIG Cluster Lifecycle does, uh, what are the key sub-projects that are involved, uh, where to find more information. There's a lot of other talks that are going on at this conference, so if you're interested in a particular topic area, I'll try to drop as many details as I can for the other uh, areas. And last but not least is how to get involved. The community is basically everyone who comes to these meetings, everyone who comes to the event, uh, who wants to contribute, right? The, what makes Kubernetes better is, is the community being involved inside of the activities of what we're trying to design and develop. We need you to keep us honest, right? If something doesn't work the way you want it to, your feedback is critical to making the product or the project itself successful. So what exactly is SIG Cluster Lifecycle? Uh, Every single SIG inside the Kubernetes community actually has a charter or a mission statement. The mission for SIG cluster lifecycle is to simplify the creation, configuration, upgrade, downgrade, and teardown of Kubernetes clusters and their components. So ideally, we want to commoditize the deployment of Kubernetes clusters, make it simple, make it secure, make it everywhere. Right? We don't want to have, uh, prevent, the path, prevent the problems that happened in the past. So if you look at other clustering software in the past and how those open source ecosystems evolved, you often found that one vendor would try to pit themselves against another vendor with just a distribution of software, right, of the base core piece of uh, componentry. We're trying to avoid that by creating a tool set or a tool chain that's composable that anyone can build their own set of installers or opinionated solutions atop of it. So what's the vision, right? <clears throat> Develop, the high, high level vision from the mission statement is to develop tooling to build in a highly automated meta cloud. That's a very generic statement that, that requires a lot of thinking to unparse and unpack, but we're aiming big, like really, really big. Um, the, the idea is that you want to be able to not care about which infrastructure you're landing on at all and make it ubiquitous so that way Kubernetes, the promise of Kubernetes is that you can run your workloads anywhere across any provider, across any infrastructure, right? And by creating that unifying set of tools or abstraction layers that we can do for deployment, it simplifies the spreading the base so that way you can leverage it across different providers. Uh, we want to develop declarative uh, API-driven Kubernetes deployments. That's part of what the mantra of Cluster API is. We want to be able to use the same primitives, practices, and processes that we use inside of Kubernetes for the actual creation of Kubernetes clusters themselves. Uh, make managing clusters as easy as managing a pod deployments across all providers. So if you can roll an upgrade for your pod deployment and have a canary deploy, we want to be able to do the exact same thing for clusters themselves. Uh, and avoid the pitfalls of yesteryear, like I mentioned before. By creating a set of tools that are individual atoms, that are reusable components, it allows us to you know, have a set of installers throughout the ecosystem that leverage key pieces of the infrastructure that we create. Uh, one of the other key uh, driving principles or part of the vision is to make the 80% use case simple, but the 20% use case possible. So anyone who's worked or looked at Kubernetes cluster deployment, there's a lot of knobs in there, right? And it's a lot to manage and think about. So we want to provide same defaults that are reasonably secure for the 80% use case, but also make the uh, customization and the optimization available for those who want to be able to do it. And as mentioned before, spread the base far and wide. So here's kind of the overview of the componentry of the stack of SIG cluster lifecycle. Like, we are one of the largest SIGs inside of the Kubernetes community. We have several sub-projects underneath our, our banner or umbrella, right? So when you look at the top of the stack, when you see Cade's cluster provisioners, there are many of them. There are several of them. But what's underneath the hood? How is it composed? Uh, at the base level layer, there's a sub-project called etcd ADM. It's, etcd ADM is basically doing lifecycle management of etcd clusters in a Kubernetes-style fashion, right? But the right now, inspired by the kubeADM, right now it's very much in its infancy. 
it could use some help. What we want to do is we don't want to maintain the code inside of Kubernetes improper, which we actually manage as the lifecycle of etcd today. We'd like to abstract that away into its own separate tool and then have Kubernetes leverage the binaries and artifacts and libraries from etcd ADM. Then there's Kubernetes, which is the, the who's heard of Kubernetes by the way? Most people know? Yeah, a lot. All right, so that's the main, that's the main central uh, project that has the most limelight, at least today. Um, uh, for, the, for the SIG. Uh, and it's basically the universal bootstrapper. It allows you to bootstrap your control plane and your cluster very, very easily. Uh, outside of that are cluster add-ons. These are the key components that re are required to make a cluster operational. Things like DNS, the kube proxy. Um, you could even think of CNI, too, as well. On top of that is the cluster API. This is a declarative way to manage your entire deployment of your clusters. As I was mentioning earlier, that's, the en that's part of the end game. Um, but, you know, it's not the end, end game. Then the whole idea is that every single one of these tools or components can then be used individually by your individual provisioners. So if you're a, a company who has a highly opinionated security view of the world, you can take any one of these components and deploy them in your infrastructure and create your own provisioning system. Right? And a lot of people do that today. So you see it used in several other tools across the ecosystem. And to the right there is image minting or image stamper. Um, if you're not doing image minting and immutable deployments, I highly recommend taking a look at that. So <clears throat> what makes the tool, what are the guiding principles that we use to create tools uh, for the tool chain in SIG cluster lifecycle? Uh, it's basically following Unix philosophy, right? Make each program do one thing well. Uh, set explicit boundary lines about what the tool should and should not do. etcd ADM was born out of the fact that we don't want to manage this inside of Kube ADM. We don't feel like Kube, we feel like Kube ADM's scope has gone a little bit too far than what we feel comfortable for, so we want to take those pieces out of both etcd ADM into etcd ADM as well as push them into cluster add-ons. So there's pieces of that that we would like to see pushed into separate locations. Uh, set non goals. There's, there's a joke that uh, a friend of mine made a long time ago. It's, he basically says every computing infrastructure project that eventually meets one need well will eventually expand its scope to meet several needs poorly. Right? This is very common. Right? You start out with one tool, all of a sudden it just becomes this balloon monolithic thing that does nothing well. Right? So we're trying to explicitly not do that in the community. Each tool is bounded in scope initially from its inception. Before a subproject gets added onto the SIG, we make sure that it has a set of non-goals. Uh, and then, you know, Unix philosophy, expect the output of one program to be used as the input of the other program. So together, when they use them all together, that's when you form Voltron. That's the Voltron moment. So here's a pseudo example. It's very, very high level and abstract, but it's enough to give you the idea of how the workflow can work in your environment, right? So if I went back a couple of slides, one thing I didn't mention was the image stamper, which is on the right. So you can have a CI infrastructure which is constantly monitoring your OS distribution or the stack componentry that you have to basically mint a new image, right? So that kicks off whenever you see a new update, CVE, whatever, you name it. It mints the new image for you. Then part of that could be a, a notification to whatever system you have, uh, to your ops system, to let you know that a new image has been created. Uh, and a, a new cluster manifest has been generated with that new image as part of the cluster manifest, right? From there, you can actually roll out a new update through CAPI. Part of the CAPI rollout and update is basically includes new KB, Kube ADM bits, and they use the in and join as part of the actual control plane flow. So here's like a pseudo moment where all the pieces of the puzzle kind of flow together. All right, so let's talk about each individual subproject. So Kube ADM is, is a, it, a tool whose primary function is to set up a best practices cluster who's optimized for user experience, right? Kubernetes init and join should work on day one across a number of infrastructure providers and just work and be simple, right? Uh, it's not meant to take on management of infrastructure. Never has, never will, right? That's kind of one of the implicit non-goals, right? Uh, it's meant to deal with only the local file system uh, and also doesn't take on the CNI itself, right? That's, a, that's an after effect. Like you can apply the CNI after you've actually deployed your cluster. Uh, one of the things that most people don't necessarily recognize, even though we kind of tout it all the time, is that Kubernetes is broken up into a set of phases. 
Each one of those phases are reusable sets of componentry that you can use in your own custom installation method. If there's an aspect to the workflow of a deployment for bootstrapping that is specific to your environment, you can take just the phase you need in order for you to actually do your deployment. If you want to do certs management, there's a separate subcommand that exists for certs management. You can take every piece of the workflow of the puzzle that it takes to bootstrap a cluster and use it independently of one another. So where does it fit in the picture? It kind of fits over in this view. I know Liz hates this slide so much with a fiery passion. Uh, but it allows people to understand a view of the world. Right? It's, it's kind of at that bootstrap layer. right? And then you can envision your, your, uh, your infrastructure as well as uh, higher level tools living on top of it. So what's coming up in KubeADM? How can you get involved? What's interesting? What's new? Uh, one of the things that uh, is coming up is simplifying the day two operations. Uh, I'll go into Cluster API in a moment, but Cluster API is meant to be immutable. Uh, KubeADM is meant to have that ability to mutate. So immutable infrastructure basically means like you shoot your machines, they go away, right? Or you shoot your images on your machines. Immutable infrastructure is I want to just deploy a patch set or a minor revision update that will occur across my infrastructure. Right, so to simplify day two operations, we're, we're looking at creating what's called a KubeADM operator. Right? The ability to actually do minor patch updates across your infrastructure in a rolling fashion. Right? Um, there's a number of other options and things that we want to do with KubeADM in the future. Uh, machine readable output. So if you use KubeADM as part of your Ansible deployment or as part of another tooling, uh, so you want to ingest the logs out of KubeADM to read them more in a machine readable fashion, uh, we're working on that. Uh, allow our easy vendoring. Currently, KubeADM was not originally designed uh, to have sort of like a client library infrastructure layout. We're doing that with other client tooling from the beginning because that's kind of one of the lessons that we learned over time. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we're trying to push uh, the componentry into the separate subprojects. So push, you know, the etcd componentry into etcd ADM, and also try to consume the cluster add-ons. Um, last but not least, uh, we're trying to move KubeADM out of tree. Um, this, for people who are not familiar with Kubernetes, if you look at the code base, it's very much a monolith. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to isolate the dependencies and the dependency management as well as the versioning apparatus for KubeADM so that it could be at a faster clip uh, so we could rev whenever we needed to uh, if there were certain security vulnerabilities that we needed to patch against, uh, but also to be able to make sure that we manage the dependencies and we don't have the dependency sprawl that can kind of happen when the code base for Kubernetes is so large and it's so easy to be able to actually accidentally import some other portion of the code base. If you want to know more about Kubidium, uh, Fabrizio, who's over there, you can ask questions of him later, uh, and Yago are going to be doing a deep dive on Thursday. Uh, it's from 3.20 to 3.55. I highly recommend going, and they'll give you all the lowdown and details, much more than what I've given you. So what's another key subproject of SIG Cluster Lifecycle? Uh, the second, probably most high profile subproject that exists is Cluster API. Uh, who has heard or knows what Cluster API is? Wow, it's a lot more than I thought. OK. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a means of, to declarative manage uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, with a Kubernetes-style API uh, across providers. Uh, currently, it's in v1 alpha 2 state. Um, we, they released that a couple of months ago uh, and are currently working on v1 alpha 3. Uh, the key distinction between the two is that it manages the, the life cycle of all the associated infrastructure around that uh, deployment. And currently, there, there's enablements for multiple bootstrap providers within the side of there, but the primary default one is KubeADM. Um, but that's the, the, another notion that we have inside of the SIG is that batteries are included but swappable. So where possible, we try to make sure we have same defaults, but if a provider decides that they would like to have their own mechanism for bootstrapping, we always want to make sure that we enable that. So if you have, uh, we have a decoupling of bootstrap providers inside of Cluster API to allow things like OpenShift or uh, to allow other technologies like Talos has a bootstrap provider too as well. Uh, last but not least is the deployment is of, of Cluster API is immutable. Uh, it's an immutable node infrastructure deployment. So the idea is that you drain, if you want to do a rolling update of your cluster, you basically coordinate and drain your nodes 
uh, then delete that node, and then a new node will come online with the new version of the software stack. Uh, what it is not, um, a lot of times when you look at Cluster API, the name is kind of a misnomer. It's not the best name. Like whenever you try to name something bidding, sometimes you always regret it later on. Um, it is not just an API. It's almost kind of like a framework. Um, so, uh, but it is definitely not a cloud abstraction layer. We are not trying to abstract or, or wrap uh, the details of a cloud provider. Uh, we are trying to provide a, a facility or means or a set of patterns that we can use to generate or create clusters in a similar fashion. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's immutable, so there's no in-place upgrades. But that doesn't mean that you can't use other tools on top of it. You can create your own operator, or you can use the Kubernetes operator, which will come next year. So what are the core pieces? Um, it's meant to be a replica of a lot of the core componentry that exists inside of Kubernetes. Uh, so machine deployments, machine sets, uh, and then there's the cluster object itself. Uh, over time, we were adding more componentry. There's, there's other pieces that are missing from here, but this gives you the basic premise of why this pattern sort of repeats itself over, right? So you, if you think of a machine set, you should think of a replica set, you know, machine, a pod. Uh, et cetera. So what's part of the roadmap for Cluster API? Um, so as I mentioned before, they're currently working on V1 Alpha 3, so that includes a first class uh, construct for control planes, which will also include uh, management of upgrades. Uh, there's the machine pool work that uh, Microsoft has been working on, and uh, there's the end-to-end -end testing framework and infrastructure. Uh, and there's Cluster Cuddle V2. Uh, Cluster Cuddle V2 is meant to be a, a means by which you can do cross-provider workflow in a similar fashion. So one of the things that is hard across providers is you can never have the abstraction layers the same, but you can't have a workflow that's the same. So long as you have a way of, rec of registering and generating for those different providers, that's a means by which you can have a similar workflow across all of them. Um, so folks are working really hard to optimize the user experience. There's a bunch of things, and even technical debt that was created as far as UX goes in V1 Alpha 2. Um, and part of this could be from defaulting, right? Because a lot of times we have explicitly set parameters inside of there, which for the 80% use case should be a default. Right? That's specified all throughout. Uh, folks are working on build and test automation. If you're interested in that, it, if you're interested in any of this, please come let us know afterwards. And we'd be happy to help uh, get you involved in the community. Um, but the build test automation is kind of a little funny. We are building uh, a set of core technologies that are basically meant to automate away a lot of your IT operations. Right? But we as a community are not necessarily good at uh, building the automation that builds the automation to, to deploy and manage our, our, our code. So we need help there. Um, we, in the next year or so, we'll be also focusing a lot of our effort towards trying to drive towards a beta release. So we want to make sure that we are setting ourselves up for long-term support capabilities so that we do a lot less churn. Uh, getting, to, getting across multiple alphas is hard because like every, part of a problem about working on something that crosses so many providers and so many domains is that there's a lot of opinions. Uh, so that way, uh, it takes a little bit of time to, to settle those opinions down to get us on a good trajectory forwards. So hopefully, by the end of next year, we should hopefully be in a beta, which has longer-term support guarantees. Kubernetes has well-defined notions of what alpha and beta and GA support equals, um, as well as adoption goals for the next year. So getting it incorporated into COPS. Uh, for those who are interested in Azure, uh, they have been very uh, helpful in trying to get the, uh, the CAPZ provider up to stuff. Uh, and last but not least, and near to near to my heart, uh, I would love to replace the slash cluster directory, uh, kill with fire, uh, <laughs> because it's been, it's been an anthema and has existed in perpetuity since the beginning of the project. No one likes it. It's just been lingering around forever. So if you want to learn more, uh, if, you're, if you have questions afterwards, uh, Vince and Anish, Ashish uh, is going to, are going to have a deep dive um, on Thursday, or feel free to hang out a little bit afterwards. We can ask, answer any questions you might have. Uh, one of the other key sub-projects that kind of ride across all of our uh, componentry is component config. Um, 
component thing is hard. It's like very, very hard. As I mentioned before, if you look at the total flag set that exists across all the components, uh, it's on the order of like six to 700 different flags across all the components. What we're trying to do with component config is unify and create a standard API for how we deal and manage with these things. It is hard. It is not easy. It takes a very long time. It's like wrangling cats. But in the, the way the Kubernetes community works and the way the infrastructure works is that there are separate owners for a lot of these different components. And sometimes you're changing one or all of them any time you're making a, a change. And that requires a lot of buy-in. Uh, to make it happen. I know I'm really selling this to you, but it is probably the most important aspect, in my opinion, for the long-term health of the component tree. And we need help there. We need people in the community who can chop the wood and carry the water and can make this change. If you want to earn your stripes in the community, you will get double gold stars. You're, you will be on top of the stage with the Chop Wood and Carry Water Award uh, if you help on this effort. So component control, Component config, I could go on forever. I could have slides which talk about it. But in reality, the, the TLDR component config is that you want to be able to just treat it like an API. You want to have a, a well-defined declarative set of configuration knobs that you can apply to a component. That's the magic. Um, some, of those, some of the components already have it. Uh, some do not. Uh, so getting, getting them to an actual beta or GA state is where we want to end, because every time these things churn, they also affect the rest, they ripple through the rest of the system. So if we, if we can get those things to GA and well-supported versions, then we can have a lot less churn in other configuration files that subsume those components or those flags or those knobs. Uh, if you want to learn more about component config, uh, Lee and Michael are having a deep dive on Thursday from 5.20 to 5.55. Um, I didn't go too deep into other provisioning tools. Remember that, that top bar of the slide that, deck that I had originally at the beginning was um, the different types of provisioners. So there is a separate talk or a deep dive for COPS uh, by Justin Santa Barbara on Thursday. And there's also a deep dive for Minikube uh, by Thomas and Midya. So how can you get involved? Right. Um, all of these different components are in a different state. right? Um, there's still a lot of work to do to, to build Voltron in its true form, right? Right now, it's kind of like a, it's a half Voltron. It might be a couple of dead robot cats somewhere. Um, but we're trying to build it again, right? It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Um, so cluster API is still in alpha state. Kubadium is in GA. It's possibly the most mature one. Uh, other cluster provisioners are also very mature that exist inside the ecosystem. Um, but we need your help. Um, so a good way to get involved uh, is there is a recording that we did a lot, while ago, a, a new contributor onboarding, which kind of walks through all the details, goes through the philosophy, the ideas, how things evolved, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I highly recommend navigating to the community page. Um, who's, who's contributed a patch here to Kubernetes before? It's a lot smaller handset, right? Um, so getting involved in the community, Kubernetes community can sometimes feel a little bit intimidating. But the reality is, it's not. Uh, it seems intimidating. I get that, right? Um, but once you start contributing and you ask questions, you'll find that everyone that works on this is super enthusiastic to have people get involved. Like, you want to help fix this bug and I don't have time to fix it? Yes, please, thank you. That's, you're helping us, right? So if you're interested in getting involved, I recommend navigating to the community page. Uh, we have a listing details of all the different subprojects for SIG Cluster Lifecycle, as well as their meeting times, uh, all the other details about where you can send emails to, what are their Slack channels, how we communicate, how we work. Right? Um, sometimes being a lurker isn't a bad thing if you want to get involved. So take a look at the different repos for the different subprojects. Look what are good first issues. Um, see how the different subprojects operate, like go to, go to attend a meeting. And then every now and then say, I would like to work on something. Right? No one will say no to you. <laughs> no one's going to be angry to, for somebody to say, uh, you know, please don't work on this. So if it's marked as good first issue or help wanted, we, we could use your help. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, everyone in the community who, who sees someone who's new, we actually welcome them into the fold. And we try to even do a separate little session or intro section if they're interested in coming along. Um, also, feel free to introduce yourself on Slack, even if it's just for questions. That's an OK thing. Uh, now, I do recommend uh, not 
asking a lot of user-facing questions all the time on Slack. There are separate channels for that. So if you inundate the developers with user-facing questions, sometimes they have a tendency to turn it off. <laughs> because sometimes it's better to go to the user communities, because users will help users. Right? If, you are, if you're a Kubedium, Kubedium user, I highly recommend going to the Kubedium channel. There are a lot of very smart people who have used Kubedium in very interesting ways that we never envisioned it to be used. Uh, and are doing very clever things with it. And they know the details of intricacies about how the, the tool and system work. Um, there is a lot more information if you want to become a contributor to as well inside of uh, the Contribex group. Um, so you can go there. Uh, they have a whole tutorial and set for how to get involved in the community beyond what we do inside the SIG itself. Uh, and the mantra that you heard at the main stage in the keynote is that we chop wood and carry water. You earn your stripes in the community by doing the work. Right? We are, we are a, a culture who values the hard work that needs to be done to help level set the playing field for everybody. Right? Um, one of the things that kind of frustrates, is frustrating as a developer or maintainer, uh, is that <clears throat> some people will come in and have an expectation that this should work like this, right? And we understand that, and it might be frustrating for you, but a lot of the people here are doing multiple things at once. It's a community. So please be kind. Be mindful that everyone here is, is probably pulling double duty or triple duty on some things right? in order to make this community be what it is today. Um, uh, but last but not least, like I mentioned before, when you chop wood and you carry water, your social capital that you earn is, is, how, is how the community flows, right? Your trust that you earn, your stripes or the bars you get inside the community, if you can become an approver or maintainer, are, are things that are earned because you have, you have worked and done the hard things for the community, right? Uh, last but not least, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come to the intro session. Um, if there are any questions that you might have, feel free to ask them. Uh, I only ask that uh, just raise your hand Say the question, and I'll try to repeat it for the recording, and then we can, uh, I can answer it for you. Go ahead. What's your question? Just the, you mentioned in one of the slides that it doesn't support control plane upgrades yet. Is that true for the cluster API? Just you can, supports. the question is uh, a couple of slides ago that it, it, cluster API doesn't support control plane upgrades. There is a separate tool uh, that exists that can do that for you. We're trying to automate that into uh, cluster API proper. The question was, is uh, Kappa, which is cluster API, cluster API provider AWS, is that a, uh, is that a mature thing yet? Um, I would recommend tinkering it. If people are using uh, Cluster API today, my recommendations are typically to wrap the behavior of Cluster API behind whatever you're doing on your infrastructure, because we are changing. Uh, so some, some people may have adopted, and being honest, it's a community-based project which has alpha in the title. Uh, they may have adopted it a, a little too early as the core front-facing piece of their componentry. Once, if you want to front-face a lot of your details, I, I think alpha three, is the most mature facing things. But even on other things that some of the things that we do, we wrap the behavior so that there's a little bit more of a friendly front facing user piece that, it, that exists in the front, right? So that's my recommendation for at this stage. But on V1 Alpha 3, I think it'll be more mature. Um, and we'll probably, we're gonna have a roadmap towards beta too as well. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, you talked twice on immutability. Yes. So yeah. So just reading through some of the forums, it seems like there's a split opinions on being prescriptive about being immutable, specifically around things like most upgrades. So I was wondering if that's still the mindset with V1 Alpha 3. When you, if you try to bring like cluster upgrades into the core component, you're probably going to have to be prescriptive one way or the other. So the question was, is immutability uh, a, still a contentious point? Uh, I, th I think for some of the people it is in the community. I think for the people who have been around since the beginning of Cluster API, it's not. 
Uh, I think there are two separate set of tools or ways of managing this, and there's no reason you can't tie them together. Right? So if you wanted to have a mutable way of managing this, you could use a, an operator style model that did the uh, modification to the spec or status inside of Cluster API. And it's basically the wrapping view of Cluster API. So if you wanted to have a mutating version, uh, that basically did in-place upgrades. You do an operator model that then just changes the spec or the status. Now, if you wanted the immutable model, then you would just use Cluster API proper to be just roll the update itself. Yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. Do we have a list of uh, the providers available or that will be available for Cluster API? Uh, there are... A, the question was, do we have a list of providers for Cluster API? There is a list of providers on the main page that are currently in the repository, as well as things that are outside of the repository, people that have built their own, uh, that would want to be involved in the main page. So usually if somebody wants to build their own, because there, there is a number of providers, um, we just ask that they PR the, the docs updates uh, to the main repo. One of the things we're doing too as well is like as we have this federated set of repositories, we are starting to develop a, a set of end-to-end -end test suites similar to the way core Kubernetes is. So ideally we want to have a, a set of conformance tests to ensure that certain behaviors of the core componentry of cluster API are consistent across all providers. Uh, oh, sorry, it's here. Yes, you have a question? Yes, uh, I highly recommend going to the, de uh, the question was, have people enumerated the state space of what needs to get done in component config and uh, uh, what are the key areas they want to address? Yes, they have, they have done the hard work of figuring out what are all the pieces that need to get done uh, and what's the high value areas they want to address first. I highly recommend going to the deep dive and talking with Michael Taufin. Yep. Yes, question in the back. Uh, the question was, do we have a rough estimate of timelines of when we think we'll get to beta or GA? Um, I, I think for sure we will get to beta uh, in the next year, hopefully. Uh, we're going to create the roadmap. We're actually creating the roadmap now for what we think is the cut line for beta. Um, I'm, I'm less concerned about the transition to GA. I'm concerned about the transition to beta. The way APIs evolve inside of Kubernetes proper is the support guarantees of what it means to be beta or GA. Usually for GA, that means a deprecation cycle that is very, very long. So we might tail beta to be a little bit longer because we might want to make a set of changes, but we will always support the upgrade process, right? So we even support the upgrade process across alphas today, right? And well, alpha one to alpha two is a little weird, but the, oh, Alpha 2 to Alpha 3, we will definitely support the upgrade process. So we did this same model for, for Kubeadm, uh, and it's, it seems a little conservative because some people kind of overfit on what the notion of GA is, but if you actually look inside of a lot of the Kubernetes APIs, they've been beta for years, like years, and people use it all the time. Uh, extensions API or the uh, for jobs and, uh, and apps API. Those, those have been beta for years and years. And it's just a matter of being mindful of what the deprecation cycle means for when you want to change this at the end. But we will definitely hit beta, I think, in the next year. Alpha 3, I think, is, is the, the sweet spots of convergence of features that people want. Yep. Uh, are there any other last questions? Uh, the question was, when you say beta, does that mean across a given set of providers? I think what we will try to do uh, is we will try to make sure that uh, AWS provider, people who have uh, known interest in helping out, we will probably actually try to get them. So most likely we will get, uh, there's a high degree of confidence we will get uh, AWS provider, we'll probably work on Azure provider, because I work for VMware, we will definitely have the vSphere provider. <laughs> uh, and the question uh, is whether or not we will
be able to get GCP provider up to that state. We probably will because we have broader plans in the community for getting that. So those will be the primary ones that we will focus on. There's, there's a whole suite of other clouds that I do not know if we will support going through or whether or not we will create the test apparatus to do the verification independently. Right. Any other questions? If not, it seems like a lot of cluster API questions. Uh, so if you're interested, please go to the deep dive for cluster API. And thank you.